You are listening to the INCJ podcast, conversations about international criminal justice. Welcome to number five in a series called the COVID Leadership Challenge. I'm John Scott, and this is an INCJ podcast and YouTube. Now, COVID-19 is presenting a unique challenge to frontline services, not just in health and social sectors, but in criminal justice as well. At INCJ, we wanted to find out how leaders internationally were handling the issues around COVID-19. So we've started a variety of conversations with criminal justice leaders to ask about their experience of the crisis. Our hope is that sharing answers will help find solutions and fresh ideas. If you want to follow this series, you'll find it on our website at criminaljusticenetwork.net or on Twitter at INTCJ Network. Now, let me introduce Phil Maguire, who is the chief executive of Prison Radio Association here in the UK. Welcome, Phil. Now, tell us where you're based. Well, that's not an easy question to answer. I'm personally based at the moment at home in Bath, in the UNESCO World Heritage City of Bath. Um, But I have teams scattered all over the place. We have two bases, one at HMP Brixton in London, one at HMP Style near Manchester. And all the staff that are normally based in those two prisons are currently all working from home offices, home studios, as am I. So tell us about your organisation. How did it start? Oh, uh, so, well, it... Predating the foundation of the Prison Radio Association was the establishment of Prison Radio, the first prison radio station in the UK. And it was in the early 1990s, um, Feltham Young Offenders Institution, which is close to Heathrow Airport, um, was experiencing lots of turmoil, lots of problems. um, And it was in the newspapers a lot. And there were two neighbours and friends um, that lived close to the prison. And they are Roma Hooper and Mark Robinson. And neither of them at this point had ever worked in a prison or been in a prison or worked in radio before. But they were sitting one night having a glass of wine together, lamenting the sorry state of the conditions that these lads had to live in in this prison. And like a light bulb moment, Mark came up with the idea of of setting up a radio station in the prison, something to give the lads some ownership of of, of something, to to give them a voice uh, and to give them something comforting to listen to when they were at the most vulnerable in a cold, dark cell at night. So they took the idea to the governor and the governor thought it was a great idea. And they then worked very hard to uh, get all the partners on board and all the funding they needed to set up what became Radio Feltham. And that launched in 1994. And it operated for many years in isolation on its own, um, very innovative project, but nobody else was doing it. And eventually, Roma Hooper, one of the co-founders, wrote to the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation, to say, look, we're doing this really exciting thing in a prison with radio. Is the BBC interested in in helping us to develop this project, to explore the potential of it on a national basis? Um, At that point, I was working at the BBC as a radio producer and occasional reporter for BBC Radio 2's Jeremy Vine show, which is the biggest news and current affairs radio programme in Europe. And I loved the job, but I was... uh, my former life, I was a residential social worker working in a children's home. So I'd done a bit of worthy work, a bit of do-gooding in the past. And I heard about this incredible project at Radio Felton, at Felton Prison, and, and became very interested in it. And then eventually, the BBC and Roma Hooper and Mark Robinson and a number of other people and the prison service started a partnership to develop prison radio. And the BBC advertised a, a post for somebody to manage the project for nine months, a pilot project for nine months to, to explore the potential of prison radio. So long story short, I applied for that, got it, spent nine months developing prison radio, setting up two new prison radio projects, exploring what potential there, there really was. And at the end of that partnership, the Prison Radio Association was formed. And this was in June 2006. OK, now I want to go back to that original idea because it sounds amazing that the two guys just chatting over a glass of wine came up with this concept uh, and then sold it to a prison governor. How, mm. how Im- imaginative was that prison governor to take the risk? Now, were they just spinning discs uh, in, in a prison cell or was it taught radio? What sort of radio was it that they were doing? It, there was a lot of 
Sorry, there was a lot of playing records. I mean, uh, uh, how I first heard about Felton was that that I just somebody told me about this radio station at prison and at Radio Two where I was working, we got sent a lot of CDs at the time from record pluggers and record companies, and I would box up all the CDs that Radio Two didn't want at the end of each month and send them boxfuls of CDs to Felton. So that's when I first heard about it. But it, it was it was a special project. It was very innovative. Uh, it was mainly lads sitting in a radio studio, a bespoke tiny little radio studio, spinning records and talking in between. It was more than that. I'm doing it a disservice to say it was just lads spinning records and talking in between. There were interviews. Uh, they tried to integrate education into it, and it was a very special project. But uh, up until the point that the BBC became interested in a partnership, there was very little professional journalism or professional radio involvement. Um, and, and the lads spinning the records and doing this very special thing were probably breaking every broadcasting rule going. Right. So let, let's start with that. That small project, yeah. You getting this uh, offer to go and stop being a professional radio person and get involved in this small project. Now I'm going to pause you there, yeah, and bring you today okay. to today. Now you're running a much you know a big operation now. So let's we'll we'll, we'll get the idea of how it grew, yeah. In a while, but tell us what your job now is, so we can get the difference between point A and where where Prisons uh, Radio Association is now. So, what sort of operation are you running now? Okay, so I'm the chief executive of a charity, a registered charity called the Prison Radio Association, and the Prison Radio Association does a number of things. But our our main job is running a radio station called National Prison Radio. National Prison Radio is the world's first national radio station for people that live in prison. It's a by prisoner for prisoner service. It broadcasts to uh, more than 100 prisons, so almost all of the prisons in England and Wales, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. As I say, it's a by prisoner for prisoner service. So pre-COVID, uh, we had professional producers based inside two prisons, working side by side, hand in hand, with people that live in prison, and it's that combination, that methodology, that makes it so special. So professional radio input side by side with people with genuine lived experience. They are the real experts in prison. So they present or co-present and co-produce or produce all of the programs on National Prison Radio, making sure that we're speaking in the right way, uh, asking the right questions, uh, and making sure that the audience gets what we do. You know, it's it's relevant and it's credible to the audience because of the way we produce programs. So National Prison Radio is what we do. It exists for a number of reasons, but the main reason is to support people through their sentences, to signpost services that are available inside prison and outside, and to support a reduction in reoffending. And we do all of this, and this is really important, in partnership with the prison service. So we operate within their buildings, we run the service, we employ the staff, they give us a grant, which is about a third of our annual income as an organization, um, but, but they are responsible for the technical infrastructure that allows prisoners to listen to National Prison Radio in their cells. So the, the partnership's an important thing. So Prison Radio Association, charity, staff of about 20. We run National Prison Radio with staff in two prisons pre-COVID. We also produce a host of podcasts for other people. We run an independent production company that makes programs for a range of people, including the BBC. Um, we are developing our expertise in supporting people through the gate and helping people that used to be in prison work in the audio industry. That's another part of what we do. And, and something that I'm incredibly passionate about that I know you want to talk about is Prison Radio International. So I've been working with people from uh, quite a number of countries around the world to learn from them, but also to try and support them where I can in developing prison radio projects. And, and I've learned so much. And prison radio works so differently in different contexts, different environments, and in diff different geographies that it, it's an incredible incredibly um, fulfilling uh, experience for me to be able to do that and to meet passionate people. Okay. So from a little acorn, a really big tree has grown. How's that happened? I think the, the core of it, the very, very core of it is that it is a bloody good idea. Um, I think that's it. Radio, you've got people in prison who are isolated. They're isolated from society. They're isolated from technology. They're isolated from media. Um, they're isolated quite often from each other, from their families. And they need to belong to something. They need a community. They need information and they need support. And up until Prison Radio came along, the main way that that happened was through leaflets or posters on walls. 
And when you consider, this is a, an old statistic, I think it still holds, that the average reading age of an adult male prisoner in the UK is the same as the average 11 year old child in the UK. So there's a lot of people in prison who are functionally illiterate. And if your main way of communicating with people in prison is through written information, leaflets and posters, um, you're onto a, a, a losing uh, endeavor to start with. Um, there's something that people know about in prisons called notice board fatigue, that occasionally you'll walk past the notice board and you'll see a poster that's got the date, you know, 2015 on it, six years out of date. And, and people tend not to engage very well with notice boards. Prison radio came along and it's a relatively inexpensive way of producing really compelling, exciting, relevant, credible information that can be delivered directly to people in their prison cells in a way that no other intervention can. And not only does it work for the audience because it's by prisoner for prisoner, but it works for everybody else involved. It works for all of the organizations statutory organizations, government organizations, third sector, NGO, charity organizations that want to work to support prisoners on a range of issues, drug, drug use, health, mental health, physical health, family relationships, financial literacy, training and employment, all of those issues. We can work with the, all of the organizations that are doing some of that in prisons or want to do some of that in prisons, and we can take their messages and quite literally amplify them. And as I say, get those messages to prisoners in their cells, directly in their cells in a way that no other intervention can. And it helps the prison services as well. So we are, I can talk more about this if you want me to, but we are fiercely independent editorially. We, we guard our journalistic integrity very fiercely, but we do a really important job of, of supporting the positive work of the prison service in giving key information about life in prison to people in prison. So it works because it's a bloody good idea. It's relatively inexpensive. People listen and they listen a lot and they act on what they hear. Um, so, so it's a bloody good idea. That's why it worked in the UK, and that's why it's working around the world. Okay. So uh, it, it gives a different voices a chance to be heard in prison, but also, in a way, gives prisoners a voice. Absolutely it does, yeah. Okay. So I think you've, you've really captured my uh, imagination here. Now, along comes COVID. Mm. I'm going to ask you, first of all, what impact did COVID have on your organisation? Uh, can I talk first about what impact it had on me as, as, the, okay. leader, as, as the leader of this organisation? Okay. I, I, I heard the word pandemic and I, I w became quite scared. I was scared for my family. I was scared for my mum who lives um, three, three or four hours away from here on her own and she's, she's quite old. So I was scared for my family and my children. I was scared for my own health. Um, I was scared for the health of my team. I've got about 20 staff that work in quite difficult circumstances, most of them working inside prisons. And, and the idea of a pandemic getting into a prison just filled me with fear and horror, you know, an incubator for, for a virus to spread. So I was scared for my team. Um, I was scared for the organization as a whole. Um, one of the most challenging jobs of any chief executive of any charity is, is bringing in the money to support the work that we do. And we had no idea what impact COVID would have on the bottom line, on the, on the, the, the ability for us to raise money. And so I was scared. That's, that's how it started. And my instinct was to try and keep everybody as safe as possible. So before lockdown happened, before the government said, if you can work from home, go and work from home, I pulled my staff out of prisons. And I, I said to everybody, stay at home. We're going to develop ways of, of supporting you in working from home. And, and, and that was complicated because, you know, I've got a nice office here. I've got, I, I, I live in a house with people that I like, my family just here. I live in a nice place. So for me, that was relatively easy. But some of my staff um, live in, in London in, in small flats that they share with family and they don't have the luxury of having an office like I do. So we, we had to work through that and see how we could support people. But, but that was the most important thing for me was to, to tell people we wanted to keep them safe, to get them to work from home and to reassure them that their safety was paramount and that, that they should try and balance work and life so that right now we're in the, the start of a global pandemic is what I said. And, and, I want, and I, I'm worried about my safety and my family's safety. And I know you are about your own safety and your family's safety. So make that the priority. 
And, and one, once you've done that, let's get on with work. And we're going to trust you. We're not going to ask anybody to clock in or clock out. We're going to ask everybody to, to do what they can to produce the programs that they, they, can, they, they, they need to produce. But if anybody's going to miss a deadline, let us know. So that was the starting point. Everybody worked from home. We scrambled. We bought lots of USB microphones. Um, we bought lots of home studio kit that was required. Um, and people, the staff, started making programs at home. Now, the big hole that that left for us was not being able to contact or work directly with people that live in prison. So on a day-to-day -day basis, people in prison present our programs, and suddenly that was missing. And, and that, was, that was a big gap for us. That was, that was difficult for us culturally, editorially, in terms of how the station sounded, that was difficult for us. But it gave us something of an opportunity. We've been doing this since 2005, 2006. So, so a decade and a half we've been doing this. And in that time, we've been working with people inside. And, and most of those people are, are now outside. And we've often sat in the pub and said, can you imagine if we got together all of the, the, the best people that we've worked with on the inside and we recruited them to work with us on the outside as, as producers and presenters? And that was a bit of a light bulb moment. That's what we did. We started to contact many of the people that we'd worked with as, uh, on National Prison Radio on the inside that were now living on the outside, and we recruited them. And we now have a network of 10 or 15 former prisoners, people that used to live in prison, that work with us on a freelance basis and regularly front our programs on National Prison Radio. So we're still getting that authentic voice. The station still sounds relevant and credible, but, but it is unfortunate that we can't be inside. So, so that's the main way that it was impacted. One other big change was communication from our audience. So the big thing that changed for prisons in the UK, probably around the world with lockdown, is that prisons were locked down. So pretty much all activity stopped, therapy stopped, education stopped, worship stopped, uh, group work stopped, only essential activity really continued. So that was, you know, if your job was cooking or cleaning, you got to carry on doing that. Otherwise, most people spent an inordinate amount of time locked in their cells, either in single cells or double cells, depending on their circumstances. Uh, and some people as much as 23 and a half hours a day in cell. So the situation for people living in prison became incredibly desperate. And and we realized at that point that National Prison Radio, up until that point, was a lifeline for people in prison. You know, massive listening figures, three quarters of people in prison listening to us for more than 10 hours a week. You know, great figures for any radio station. We realized that now it was, it was more important than ever. Absolutely a lifeline. And so we tried to make sure that we gave our audience the information that they really needed now. We started doing a regular interview, a weekly interview with the Director General of the Prison Service, putting prisoners' questions directly to him about the situation. So really holding power to account and asking difficult questions, but also giving information about changes in regime, changes in visits, what's happening on the ground, information that people in prison might not otherwise have had. But we also opened our free phone line. So we've always had great relationship with our audience and a great level of correspondence. Pre-COVID, we were getting six or 7,000 letters every year from our audience and an audience of about 80,000 people, which we were very pleased with. Lots of work going through those letters and working out how to translate them and, and put them on air and turn them into content. Um, but, but, but a great thing. Um, writing letters became difficult. Getting access to paper and stamps became more difficult for people in prison. And, and getting in prison to go and collect the letters that people wrote to us in HMP Brixton became difficult. So we opened our free phone line and we told everybody inside, phone us, phone us and ask us to play you a tune. Tell us what's on your mind. Talk to us about the situation you find yourself in. Send us questions for the Director General of the Prison Service. And the numbers that we got were incredible. Um, we, we were getting 6,000-ish letters every year. We started getting in excess of 3,000 calls every month from people in prison. So in the first 10 months of COVID, we had, I think, 30 plus thousand calls from people in prison. So that's changed as well. So the situation in prison is difficult and it's dire. The situation for us was potentially very scary and, and, and very dodgy. And we didn't know what our future was. But actually, we pivoted. We've, been adap we, we've adapted well. We've learned a lot of lessons from this experience. We think the station sounds better than it's ever sounded. We, we think the information we're giving to our audience is, is more accurate, more timely, and more important than ever before. Um, 
and we fared very well and we've learned some lessons that post covid we will we won't just go back to what we did before we'll learn from what we're doing now and we will adapt um and and we will come out of this stronger than we were before we went into it what worries have your staff brought to you about covid i i, I think the same worries that we've all got you know people are worried about their vulnerable relatives people are worried about are we going to be when we are when we do go back when are we going back into prison you know what are the prison service saying about that how are we going to make sure that we're safe when we get in there are we suddenly going to be told next tuesday we all have to go back in how's that going to work so uncertainty i mean i i quite like change i embrace change i think it's i think it's a really positive way of of developing things um and i've never been afraid of it but but some people are worried about change and and change can be unsettling for a lot of people. Um so I think I think that's that's been the main message but I, I think I hope that my staff are felt looked after and cared for through this process. And and I hope that well I know now that they're all excited about going back in and about working out how we're going to navigate the the you know what happens next. Mm-hmm. How how we develop and how we deliver a, a really important and impactful service post covid. What do you think is the most innovative development of the pandemic for the radio service? For for National Prison Radio, uh, well, well, I think th- uh, the two things, the two biggest innovations, are the two things I've just talked about. So, one being, we we now are heavily reliant on people that used to live in prison. So we've got a network of freelancers working with us, and we won't let that go. Great. So when we go back inside, we will work hand in hand side by side with people serving prison sentences sentences and they will play a crucial role in what we're doing but we won't stop working with people on the outside because they add massive value and and we hope that by working with us we're we're adding v- real value to them and that's we I'm currently in the process with my senior team writing a new business plan to run from April 2021 for 3 years and one of our strategic aims is is around supporting people from the criminal justice sector to work in the audio industry. So so that's a big change for us. It's a big change for how National Prison Radio sounds and how we operate. That's the big one. And the other one is um giving people in prison much more of a voice on air and listening to them much more by opening the phone line and going from 6000 letters a year to, you know, 35000 calls a year. Um, and that that's a significant we've had to employ somebody to to deal with that with that influx of calls and those calls are, are voicemails so people phone us and they leave a voicemail for us so we can listen to the voicemails we can work out what the mood is we can respond to that with our content we can play some of those voicemails on air we can take questions for for people that we're interviewing and put them directly from people in prison so so those are the two big innovations i think okay. i'm interested do families ever ring you are any of the phone calls from you know the children or the partners of prisoners we we'd like to do much more for families so we we produce a request show and it was one of the first shows that we started many many years ago we had a, a, an hour long weekly show called the request show and and it became so popular that we had to increase it to from an hour a week to an hour a day and then two hours a day and and then we started well then we launched a few years ago the the Friends and Family Request Show. So this is a program that goes out both on National Prison Radio and externally. And I should say that National Prison Radio is available only inside prisons. So it, we broadcast via the television sets that sit in the corner of every prison cell in the country. Um, the TV sets have ten channels. Nine of them are TV channels, and one of them is an audio channel, and that's National Prison Radio. So National Prison Radio, as a radio station, is not available for you and me to listen to outside, John. Um, as, or, or, for, or for members of the public to listen to outside, I should say. Um, but we produce a regular weekly program, um, which is a request show for friends and family, which broadcast both on National Prison Radio and on the outside for people to listen to. We stream it on the outside. And so yet we get lots of contacts from friends and family of people in prison, giving them shout out, giving them, sending them love. And I guess it's one of the oldest radio formats. I think before Radio 2 was called Radio 2, um, there was a program called, oh, what was it called? You might know this, John. Well, when it was on the light program. So yeah. Fam- family favourites. Family favourites. That's what I was looking for. So it's one of the oldest radio formats that exists, you know. Yeah. And, and, and during the war, um, for example, people would phone in and send messages all around the world, wouldn't they? Yeah. Uh, and it, it's that sort of connections. Um, you'd, you'd think that that sort of idea of making a connection uh, would, would be very, very attractive. Um, I was also wondering, have you been commissioned 
to do any specific sort of program, whether it be by health educators or uh, different parts of uh, uh, different services going into prisons, particularly during the pandemic, because they can't get in. Have you been commissioned to do any specific programs during the yeah. pandemic? Yeah, we have. We have. I mean, that's that's a big part of what we do. So part of our operating model is working in partnership with organisations that want to get their messages to people in prison. And uh, generally, those relationships are, I guess, commercial relationships. We couldn't exist financially as an organisation without people paying us to make programmes about their services. So we don't carry traditional adverts. We're not a commercial radio station. We don't advertise things that people can buy we don't advertise dave's motors or john's pizzas um we work in partnership with organizations that share our aims of supporting prisoners through their sentences and reducing reoffending. and so we are on an ongoing basis working we I mean we work with more than 200 organizations every year to help them get their messages to people in prison um, a couple of notable programs that i can think of at the moment are um, the warm up is a new program that we've been commissioned to make for Sport England, and this is to encourage people inside to to stay fit and active in these difficult circumstances. So that's that includes inspiration and, and a bit of meditation, but a, a, an in cell workout is part of the the program. So I'm wondering the, why Joe Wicks hasn't done one for people inside prisons. Well, there you go. There's an there's an opening there. I maybe think. maybe he has. <laughs> well, we'll ask him. What I'm, I'm going to move us uh, focus a little bit because I'd, I'm I'm fascinated by the potential for reaching out into other countries because uh, we know that the power of radio uh, and the airwaves is sensational and for for developing the sense of community in, into prisons is 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 really large uh tell us a little bit about whether people have come to your organization to learn and to listen what sort of outreach have you been able to have internationally phil i, I guess the first time uh, that this happened is we had a visit from there are th these amazing people that have become really really dear friends of mine called garth, garth sinclair and natasha nunez sinclair and and they are they live in Trinidad and Tobago. They're from Trinidad and Tobago. Garth is um, a remarkable guy, former soldier um, that got involved in drugs and was uh, dishonorably discharged from the army and and served a prison sentence. And he got out of prison and he was he was trying to work out what he wanted to do next. And he came up with the idea of a radio show. And he pitched it to his friend, Natasha, who's now his wife. And together they, they started a weekly radio show uh, called Eye on Dependency. And it's about drug trafficking and drug dependency and, and the world of drugs. And he started, they started um, coming over to the UK once a year to try and talk to Caribbean nationals that were locked up in British prisons um, for, for drug importation. Uh, and they'd, we, we'd work with them and we'd, we'd help them get into prisons and they'd go and interview Caribbean nationals for their radio show in Trinidad and Tobago. And they saw what we were doing with National Prison Radio and they said, we should do this. We should do this. So they went back to Trinidad and they talked to the prison service and they talked to the British High Commissioner over there. And we were then invited over by the British High Commission. Me and, and my deputy, Andrew Wilkie, went over there uh, on a mission really to persuade their government that prison radio was a worthwhile endeavor. And we spent a week over there. It's a tough job, but somebody has to do it. Um, but we went to Trinidad and Tobago and it was an incredible week. It was a whirlwind experience. We were picked up from the, the airport, tired, wearing shorts and a t-shirt. We, we got there, we were waiting for our lift. So we stood at the, the bar on the, the, outside the main doors of the airport and we had a pint. We jumped into a car when Garth and Natasha came to collect us thinking we were going to our hotel. And our first stop was at the office of the head of the prison service. <laughs> And, and the week carried on like that. Minute by minute, we went to see prison governors, uh, heads, heads of services. And the culmination of it was a meeting with the, the then Justice Secretary of Trinidad and Tobago. Um, at, at a bit, and we were on breakfast TV. We, we did lots of media as well. And, and it culminated in this breakfast meeting, this breakfast, I guess it was a press conference. The national press were there. I, 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 me, I stood up with my colleague, Andrew, and we did a presentation. And then Minister Volney, the then Justice Secretary, stood up to do his, his speech. And essentially he, he tore up his, his, his speech that had been pre-written for him and said, look, I'm convinced I'm gonna write a check for this. We're gonna make prison radio happen. And, and, and we then remotely for about 11 months helped advising. We a very good friend of ours who's an expert in building studios, went over there to help them build the studios. And 11 months later, 
we went back there to to help to cut the ribbon on Rise Maximum Radio in in a maximum security prison in Trinidad and Tobago, and and I was delighted to be able to make I, I presented a documentary for BBC World Service about that experience called Reality Radio, which is still available on the BBC World Service website. So so that was our first experience of supporting people overseas. Uh, and that was that was quite a few years ago. Uh, and then we started being contacted by lots of people, people that had heard about what we were doing and wanted to learn or had been doing prison radio themselves. And then they discovered that it was going on elsewhere. So we started talking to people. So Israel is a notable example. We were working with Israel for many years, uh, giving them support and advice, sharing information with them about how to develop prison radio. And Israel now has Radio Focus, a national radio station for prisons in Israel. And uh, I went over there just before the pandemic started, just before, like two weeks before lockdown happened, to, to help celebrate three years of Radio Focus, uh, an event at the Ministry of Justice there. Um, we've been working with Hungary since 2012. Unfortunately, the radio project that was developed in Hungary is, is currently in a hiatus, probably until there's a change of government. Um, but Norway, I've got an incredible radio station, um, a radio project operating, I think, in four or five prisons now. They have a weekly program on Norwegian national broadcasters, national broadcaster. They're doing incredible work. I went to Australia two years ago to speak at the uh, com- uh, the CBAA, the Community Broadcasting Association of Australia's annual conference about prison radio. And while I was there, there are two incredible people called Dr. Heather Anderson and Dr. Charlotte Bedford. They're the, the two, I think, the world's two only doctors of prison radio. And they launched the Prisoner Radio Network in Australia, where there's about six or seven or eight radio projects in prisons. A podcast that's that's produced... In, in the very north of Australia, won Podcast of the Year at the Big Radio Awards in Australia this year. So not specific prison awards, actual the full radio audio awards. America, the United States of America has got some incredible projects. So Ear Hustle is the, the very well-known project, um, which has won a Peabody Award or been nominated for Peabody. It's won all the big awards and it's an incredible listen. It really is. And we work closely with them. Um there's uh, KALW also working in the Bay Area, uh, producing an incredible podcast and developing prison radio there. And at the moment, I'm working closely with um, the University of Denver Prison Arts Initiative, who are developing a, a, a statewide prison radio station in, in Colorado. And I've started working very recently with an incredibly talented and inspirational woman uh, in India who's a lecturer, professor of uh, journalism at the University of Delhi, but also runs a charity called Tinker Tinker. She's a prison reformer and she's launched four prison radio projects, which I recently found out about and I'm, I'm in regular contact with. And I've probably missed out lots of other people, so I apologise if I've missed anybody listening. But we are now all collaborating, working together. In November, we came together to have the first Prison Radio International Conference, a virtual conference via Zoom. So this is something that couldn't we wouldn't have thought of doing remotely pre-COVID, but we were able to meet in November. We're hoping to meet again in May. And in 2022, fingers crossed, we're all going to get together, or all of us that can travel are going to get together in Norway. Um, and we'll be able to do a, a conference, which is a combination of remote Zoom conference and and, and in-person conference. But it's, it's incredibly, incredibly powerful what's going on around the world. And I think collaborating and working together and um, showing that we're part of a global movement is useful for us all because it's a very prison radio can be a very lonely thing. Um, so to be there for each other is, is incredibly important and incredibly powerful, but, but for the governments, and, and this is a key part of what all of us do is, is work in partnership with or alongside governments. And, and part of our job is persuading government that what we want to do is the right thing to do. So by being part of a big global movement, it helps all of those individuals persuade those in charge of prisons that this is a worthwhile endeavour. Yeah. And what I'm interested to find out is that uh, although your enthusiasm is boundless, uh, and I suspect you need to draw breath after that litany of, uh, of, connect- of connectivity, um, I'm interested to know if there's any research about uh, impact. Yeah, well, yes. Um, there, there, there's... It's interesting. So the the two doctors that I mentioned, Dr. Yeah. Heather Anderson and, and Dr. Charlotte Bedford, are both they've both got their PhDs via their research into prison radio. So right. Charlotte Bedford's got a book available, which is called Making Waves Behind Bars, which is a fantastic sort of um, 
history of prison radio in the UK. There has been all of the individual projects that, that we're working with around the world all have their own um, evaluation, monitoring and evaluation methodologies and activities. We've been working really hard for many years to, to make our evaluation methodology as robust as possible. I think with a project like this, it's really important that you, you know what you're doing so you can set out what it is you're hoping to achieve and that you can articulate that on paper, in conversation, that, that, that before you've started, you know what it is you're trying to do. It's really important that you can measure it. And then it's really, 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 really important that you can then talk about that impact. So talk about how you measured it and, and what you've achieved. So for many years, we've been developing working in partnership with a range of different people and organizations to develop our evaluation methodology. And, and we, we feel we have a, a very robust evaluation uh, system. We have a, a, a direct director of development who's in overall charge of our evaluation as, as well as other things. We have a brilliant evaluation manager and we spend a lot of time talking to people in prison, surveys, questionnaires, a big annual questionnaire via Inside Time, which is the national newspaper for prisoners in the UK. So, so we do lots of talking to our audience about what we're doing right, what we could be doing better but we 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 realize that this is a constantly evolving process and evaluating your own activities can can it, it can be very interesting experience and it's worth getting outside expertise so we were very lucky recently to um, be awarded a, a significant grant to essentially evaluate our own evaluation so we're working in partnership with um, a brilliant organization called the art of regeneration who are having a look at our evaluation uh, seeing whether what we're doing works whether it uh, gives an accurate picture of, of, of what we what we do and what we achieve and they're helping us to develop our evaluation further that's good now phil you're something of a of a of an outsider uh, in the criminal justice system, you go in and out of prisons, and you're, you're essentially you're a broadcaster. And I'm wondering if you uh, have any observations about the blind spots that professionals who are inside the system might have. Um, do I have any insights on the blind spots that people are inside the, the work system in the system might have? So what so so what are you asking me? What could work better in in prisons? No, no, I'm thinking about well, for example. Um, the terminology, you're, you're very good with language, the sort of the terminology that just trips off the tongue, the jargon, that sort of stuff. Yeah, I, uh, I think it's really, really easy to, to, to confuse people with terminology. And I think we, we had a conversation, I had a conversation with my team, I think yesterday or the day before on Slack, our communications channel. There was an article in, uh, I think it was in the Spectator uh, magazine about calling people in prison residents. Um, which I don't think is right. I don't think people, it sounds like they've chosen to be there to call them residents. But but I really don't like the term inmates. I don't like the term offender because um, you're describing a person by a behaviour that they once exhibited or maybe more than once. I really don't like the term ex-offender because after somebody gets out of prison, people are, are still labelling them by a, a behaviour that they once did. Um you know, I once fell off my bike. People don't call me ex-bike faller offer. Um, I, I just think it's it's ridiculous, and it's and it's hard to find the right terminology. And the, the simplest thing I think is prisoner, but I don't like that. So you'll have noticed that I tend to try and talk about people that live in prison, or people in prison, or people that have lived in prison. Um, but yeah, it's difficult. It, it's a difficult thing. I think there are lots of blind spots. Um, I've I. I've got quite strong political opinions, but I think one of the strengths of the Prison Radio Association is that we have existed as an apolitical organisation for many, many years. So there are lots of organisations that work in the criminal justice sector whose job is to try and force change through political dialogue. And, and I, I, ours isn't one of those organisations. So yes, we as a, as a broadcaster, as an internal broadcaster for the prison service, we hold power to account. We ask very difficult questions to people in authority on behalf of our audience, which is an audience of people in prison. So in that respect, we are being good journalists and asking difficult questions. But I, I generally avoid um, talking publicly about deficiencies or otherwise of the prison service. Um, simply because I have to work alongside whoever's in government, whoever's running our prison service and those civil servants that I've got lots of time and respect for. Um, I think the people running the service on a day-to-day -day basis um, have to run it regardless 
of who is in power, which government or which, this week, who's, who's the justice secretary this week or next week. So I've got a huge amount of respect for the people doing that. And I think, you know, almost all of them are doing it for the right reasons. They work incredibly hard um, in, in the face of, you know, a very bureaucratic system to, to run a service that, that supports people in prison as best as possible. Um, the most I will say politically is I think there are too many people in prison. I think if there's a simple way of improving our prisons, um, having said, I'm not going to say anything political. I think if, if there's if there's a way of improving our prisons, it's, it's put fewer people inside. Um, I think in in the last, I think it's around 30 years, our prison population has doubled. So there used to be about 40,000 people in prison, and now there's, there's 80,000 people in prison or thereabouts. And that isn't because people have become more naughty. It isn't because people are out there committing more crime. It's because lengths of sentences have changed and sentencing policy and guidelines have changed. And, and governments, this is difficult as well. Governments want to be seen to be hard on crime because that gets support from from the general public and it, and it wins them votes or, or they perceive that. Um, so by being hard on crime, they, they, they are hoping it's going to help them get into government next time. Um, but budgets have been cut because the economy has not been in a great place over the last few years. So we've got a bigger population and a smaller budget. That's a recipe for disaster. So I think if, if there were fewer people in prison, if only the people that were, were dangerous or, or, or couldn't be helped outside were in prison, we'd have a much better chance of, of making society safer and, and helping there become fewer victims um, and, and helping people that, that have committed crime to, to commit less crime or to stop committing crime. If there was one thing you could change about prisons, what would it be? Yeah, I, I, fewer people in them. Simple. Okay. Now, um, language is your business. Mm -hmm. And isn't it strange how lockdown has been the the phrase, everybody has leapt on. And uh, people have talked about looking at walls all day and loss of freedom. Um, do you think we as a society will be more aware, more sensitive about the meaning of imprisonment? Or do you think it's a bit fake, this? I don't know. I, I hope so. I, I co-present a podcast called The Secret Life of Prisons with with a brilliant, brilliant person called Paula Harriet. She's my co-host. And she, she, she's uh, on the senior management team of the Prison Reform Trust. And she, her job is to, to, she's head of prisoner involvement. So she's she's really there to give a voice to people in prison. And she and I host this podcast called The Secret Life of Prisons, which is, is there to shine a light on um, what life is really like in prison. And, and when the lockdown happened, I saw a tweet from a guy called Raphael Rowe. Now, Raphael Rowe is an incredible guy. He's, he's actually one of my bosses. He's on my board of trustees. But he served 12 years inside for a murder that he didn't commit. And his sentence was overturned and he got out. And he's then had an incredible career as a journalist, worked as a, a reporter on BBC Newsnight, BBC Radio Force Today programme. Um, he's currently the host of um, a Netflix series about the world's toughest prisons. So he, he's an incredible guy. But he tweeted something along the line of people keep saying that lockdowns like prisons well no it isn't mm. um and it isn't but we took that tweet and interviewed Raphael and then had a conversation with a few people about whether 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 lockdown is like prison and you know I I've worked in prisons for a long time but I've never been a prisoner Paul has been a prisoner um and I was really interested to learn from her and she said actually there are things that we can learn and maybe just maybe people people being at home and not being able to go out, you know, it's not the same as being in prison because we can go to the shops. We can come out of our bedroom. We can go downstairs. We can choose to what we eat and when we eat it. So it's in, in many, many ways, it's not at all like prison, but, but just maybe there'll be a little bit more empathy for people who are locked up inside. But it, it, if somebody's sitting there thinking, well, lockdown is like prison, you know, we're, we're, we're not allowed out. Actually go into your smallest bathroom in your house, go in there with a stranger, put a bunk bed in there, leave the toilet in the corner and stay in there for 23 and a half hours a day together. And that's, that's a bit more like what prison's like. Mm. Has the pandemic made you rethink your approach to work? Uh, yeah, I mean, ab absolutely. Um, I, I've been very lucky since I've been working for the organisation that I've always had an office at home. So I've divided my time between being based at home and spending time working with my teams and visiting prisons around the country. Um, but, but primarily, I've been based at home. And I think, I think it's going to change work practices globally. 
that we know it's much more efficient for many, many people to work at home. No commute, mm. um, no distractions. I, I can't imagine that, you know, once upon a time, John, we would, we would have, there's no way we would have done this remotely. We'd have arranged to hire a studio somewhere. You'd have traveled from where you live. I'd have traveled from where I live. We'd have spent, you know, hundreds of pounds on travel <laughs> and on studios. And we'd have got together for an hour and had this conversation and then got back on trains and gone home again. Whereas you're sitting, I presume at home, I'm sitting, yes. at, I'm sitting at home and we can just jump on this call and, and do it in real time. So I think working remotely and talking to each other through video chats on calls like this uh, make us much more efficient and, and take a lot of the stress and expense and unnecessary um, pressure uh, from from a lot of the things that we do at work. Um, but we have to balance that. I, I, I think many people want to stay working at home permanently. I, I, that worries me a bit. Uh, I work in a creative industry. I work in radio. And I think a big part of, of making our content as creative as it can be and, and making it make sense is being in an office with someone or being in a space with somebody and looking them in the eye and asking them a question and not just sending them a message on Slack or sending them an email or doing a quick phone call or a quick video call with them, but actually being in the room with them and feeling their reaction to what you're talking about. And, I, and I'm concerned about losing that. And I think um, all of the young people that, <clears throat> you know, I think people these days in this country find it much more difficult to get on the property ladder than they used to. People are living at home with their parents for longer. And for many people, that daily commute, that daily trip to work on their bikes or on foot or on a bus or on a train, it was an important part of their day of, of getting out and being part of the world. And, and I just, I'm slightly concerned that if everybody starts working from home, we're all going to be, we're all going to become much, much more isolated from each other. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it'd be interesting to see what happens. Yeah, yeah. My suspicion is that we've got to learn to integrate uh, and get the best of both worlds rather than narrow down. Yeah. Um, has it been a bit weird being interviewed rather than being an interviewer? No. Um, you've got me on my favourite subject, John. So but yourself? <laughs> no, no, not myself. Prison radio. Prison radio. Um, so I, I could talk all day and at great length, as you've probably realised, and I'm so enthusiastic about pr prison radio and what we do and the potential for it. It, so. it just it just rings out. And I'm sure that anybody listening is going to uh, want to start a radio service in their own country if they're involved in prisons. Well, if anybody, um, if anybody does, can you ask yeah. them to get in touch with me? And you can reach me very simply on my email, which is phil at phil, P-H-I-L, at prison dot radio very simple that, that is a really big call out and i'm hoping people will do that um last word to you um have you got any uh advice for how people should come out of covid19 and sort of prepare themselves for a for a future uh, maybe a radio future i don't know i'm not qualified to give people advice i don't think i mean i give my kids that when i drop my my youngest son off at school each each morning, I always say the same thing to him. And, and I think that applies to, to everything, not just coming out of COVID, which is work hard, be kind and have fun. And, and I just think if we can do those things, I think being kind, I always say to him, and the most important one is be kind. Um, just, I think now more than ever, I think we've realized through this terrible situation. And, and I want to say that, you know, I've, I've coped very well with this. I've not been sick. I've not lost anybody that I love, but there's an awful lot of people who have had a very, very difficult time and are having a very difficult time. Um, and I, and I just hope that what's happened, if anything good can come from it, we can become a more compassionate world, more compassionate societies. And, and so I would say to people, be kind, support each other and help each other. But as for giving people advice, I don't think I'm qualified. Well, I think that your message to your son is a very good sign-off message. So uh, all you people out there, thanks very much for listening. Please stay safe. And I hope you can join us next time. Uh, goodbye and thank you very much, Phil. Uh, our podcasts are available on your no normal provider. That's through iTunes and Google under INCJ Podcasts. Thank you and goodbye, everyone. You have been listening to the INCJ podcast, conversations about international criminal justice. To find out more, go to our website at criminaljusticenetwork.net.
or follow us on Twitter at INTCJ Network.